Thank you. I want to say thanks to the Central Wyoming Senior Services Center to having me and thanks to Walgreens for providing my paycheck to be here. They're paying me to be here. They thought you guys were a worthy investment. And also thanks to the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists, which I'm a part of. These are the guys that will meet with you one-on-one -on -one, um, to discuss your medication list and find ways for you to save money and to make sure that what you're taking is safe and appropriate for where you're at in your life. So those are some options. Today we'll just start off with two topics. Um, we're going to be talking about prescription drug misuse and abuse and we'll talk about how to save money when you're in the Medicare Part D donut hole because a lot of times uh, that's a difficult time and we're right we're right there I'm seeing a lot of patients in my practice coming through saying okay I can't I can't afford this today I'll only take this medication and we'd like to we'd like to help okay so first of all let's start with a quick review we talked about prescription drug misuse and abuse in January so I won't go as long as I did before but we talk about um, why we, we see this especially when our bodies age and it's because we, as we get older, we have more things go wrong. You know, it's like a car, we're, you know, we need a little more oil, we need this, but we take more medicines, and our bodies change. Our bodies will sometimes metabolize medicines more slowly. Uh, they may not work as well, so we may take more. We may see more doctors because we now need specialists, or we may have a reason to go to you know, a cardiologist and a, and a gastroenterologist, so. We have more medical problems, and we also may be harmed by more medications. So, say one doctor says you need this for your stomach, but the other doctor says, well, that medication for your stomach is going to deteriorate your bones. Those things um, can interact, and we need to make sure we're talking to you, the one who's most affected, uh, make sure that you know what you can do to help prevent problems. So. Sometimes we get into trouble with taking our medications. We misuse them, and it's really easy to do. I, I have been known to misuse medications where I don't, don't take them when I should, and that's a misuse. I use them in, other than how the doctor prescribed. So we may take more medication um, than we were supposed to, maybe instead of three times a day we take it for. We may take less medication because we forget. <laughs> and I'm Pharmacy school did not help me remember to take my medications. <laughs> what it did help me do is find ways to take medications so that even if I forget, my medication's working for me. So that's what I'd like to help you guys do. Uh, we stop early, we give others our medications because hey, if it worked for my headache, it'll work for yours, right? <laughs> we used to be able to do that um, without too much issue, but our medications are specialized now. And we can cause serious problems, so we should just stop doing that. And we take other people's medications, so that's all misuse, just other than how the doctor has prescribed. Um, important, it's really important to keep that communication open with doctors saying, well, what you're giving me right now is not working. I need to have more. And then, then it's not misuse anymore. That's communication back to your doctor. So, misuse can lead to prescription and drug abuse. So that's where we're now intentionally doing it. It's not like, oh, well, I, I accidentally took a couple more. Now I'm like, well, I know I need a couple more, but I'll just fill that prescription early, that kind of thing. We may take it more often. We may take it for no medical reason. We just, we just feel better, but we don't actually have legitimate pain needs, for example. Uh, we may think that, well, if one worked, two will be better my cholesterol will really lower if I take two. <laughs> we could mix medicines with alcohol or other illegal drugs. Um, it's, it's something that we don't like to talk about, but it happens. Like one in five people has some type of addiction. Well, we know more than five people, so we know people that may be mixing something that they're addicted to with the prescription drugs they're taking, and that's dangerous. It's, you know. Something that if we care about those loved ones, we want to we want to help them out. So we'll talk about being part of that solution. We want to help ourselves. We want to help others, and we'll stamp out prescription drug misuse and abuse. And I like that acronym because it talks about safely taking all medications properly. Properly meaning talking to our doctors, talking to our pharmacists about what's going on when we take these medications, and if something needs to be changed, we change it. So it doesn't mean we just follow directions and don't say anything and we took it like we're supposed to. We, we get to give feedback. That's part of the proper. I'd like to 
point that out because it, I want to make sure we know we're in the driver's seat. The way we can do that is to keep our medication list up to date. We should include all of our medications, herbal supplements, the Tylenol that we take. How often do we take that Tylenol? Do we have to take ibuprofen five, six times a day? That's important to know. If we now are taking an over-the-counter medication because our insurance doesn't cover it anymore, does our doctor know that we're no longer taking that prescription? Does our pharmacist know? Those things we should let them let them hear. And I usually see that because if you come to my pharmacy, I'll go out to the front of the counter and help you pick something that is not prescription. And I will look at what your medication list is and talk to you about it. Um, make sure that we talk to our doctors before we stop or change medication, especially when we can't afford it or we no longer think it works for us or we're experiencing something, some symptom that's related to the medication. We think it's the cause of it. Keeping that communication open with the doctor means that they're not going to give you something that could do the same thing in the future. And then we don't crush or break that medication without medical advice. There are a lot of tablets that we can split and a lot we can't. So if we're having trouble swallowing the pill because it's too gigantic, that's a great question. I love to help with that. So um, talk to me, talk to a doctor, talk to a nurse. There are so many other professionals I'm leaving out, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, all of everybody in the healthcare team can help with that. And then let's clean out our medicine cabinets. Uh, I do that every time I set my clocks. I pull out what's in my medicine cabinet and get rid of it. Now, mostly it's because I have small children and they will possibly get into whatever I have left out and I don't want that. So um, think about that. If we have people visiting, they could end up taking a medication that was not meant for them. Or we could take medication not meant for us. We just forgot. <laughs> uh, we should also protect the environment. When taking medications properly, we don't want to just toss them in the trash, right? So how many people here know that there's a place that you can dispose of your medication safely? We Sweet. covered it in an earlier yeah. program, remember? Yes, <laughs> and you can refer back to that. But I like to throw that out because there's... You know, there's always a way that we can dump off medications and, and have them disposed of properly. Um, we don't need to flush them, we don't want to pour them, and we want to use community take back programs. I don't have a list of those programs on me, but there is a link in your handout under the dispose of expired medications properly section where it can show you the medication take back days and then just as a link, <coughs> uh, medication disposal site at Wyoming Medical Center and there's one over at the sheriff's office downtown in the foyer, so you don't have to be there when they're open. You can go in, and it looks like a green mailbox, and you can put your medications in there. We had an officer come by um, and speak on the very subject, and he even said that if you see a, a police officer around town, you can just give him that, uh, you know, it, um, that stuff that That's if you have to have it with you, and, and they can take it and dispose of it for you properly, so. That's great to hear. Yep. Huh. I did not know that. Thank you. So I know with one. <laughs> my son's a cop. There you go. <laughs> I have a neighbor that's a patrolman. I'll go leave it on his step. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Early delivery. <laughs> so with that's the rundown on um, stamping out prescription drug misuse and abuse. And it, you know, it costs more too if you have side effects related to misusing medications, right? So let's talk about saving money, not just saving your health. That's where we bring um, the saving money in the donut hole. <laughs> I think the donut hole needs to be abolished, and by 2020, hopefully it will be. But and what is that? The donut hole, thank you. I will show you a diagram <laughs> of the donut hole. <laughs> I would also like to say this was made possible by the Central Wyoming Senior Services Center, not the Casper Senior Center, and Walgreens. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate this. You know, all the prescriptions in the world aren't going to do you a bit of good if you can't afford to take it. So my goal is to make sure that this, whatever medications you take, do you good. Um, this is a, a my drawing of the donut hole. Now, I'm a pharmacist, I'm not an illustrator, so I'm sorry, <laughs> but you do have in your handouts a picture of that donut hole, and it looks like this. If anybody who's watching wants to have a, a forward, there are some links at the back of this handout that I can try to make available, and you can look up this, this diagram yourself. So 
it really in my mind. But I'll give you the short gist of it. At the beginning of the year, that's a way over on the edge, you start off with whatever prescription Part D plan you have. Now, Part D is different than Medicare Part A or Part B. Part D covers your drugs. It's not a supplemental, it's not Medicare Advantage, it's just Part D that I'm talking about. And this information is a quick and dirty, there are so, so many more facets to it depending on where your poverty level sits. But let's say you don't qualify for any of those special programs and you just get to pay for everything. This is the general population. You start off with paying about $320 in a deductible. And we were talking earlier, there may be special rules, like if you get a generic, maybe they don't make you pay the deductible, maybe they do. And every plan is different. But after you pay that, you can expect that they will be required to pay 75% of your medications and you pay a quarter of it. Until you have $2,960 $2, of total costs. Once that happens, you hit the donut hole. They also call that the coverage gap. So whatever you want to call it, that's the point where you are responsible for 100% of those medications until you accrue a certain amount of out-of-pocket costs. Now, there, due to some recent legislation, we have, even in the donut hole, you pay 65% of the generic cost, and then you pay 45% of brands. There may be additional discounts depending on the plan that you're with, so consider that um, so you have a higher percentage that, or a higher um, discount with the brand, but you also might have a higher cost. So. Um, a lot of times, this is where I have people coming in and asking me for uh, drug-specific discount cards. And often those do not work if you're on Medicare. It's because a government-subsidized program is not allowed to take special incentives by commercial interests. It's a fairness issue. They don't want you to be swayed by, you know, drug B because they have a special coupon. Um, what happens, though, is that you end up paying more money when you could have gotten a discount. Now, there are a couple of discounts that you can apply to Medicare, Medicaid, or whatever their government programs, but they're hard to find and I don't have them off the top of my head. I do have some links there, though, that can help you find them um, listed in my little program. So, after you complete at least $4,700 of annual out-of-pocket thresholds, and that is including your deductible, that counts toward it, and also you see that you pay 65% of the generic, the total cost of the generic counts as your out of pocket. Um, then you enter what they call catastrophic coverage. Then you're on the other side of the donut hole and you're paying 5% of the costs. Um, you're also paying 2.65% of the generics and 6.6% of brand. So your co-pays are roughly $2.65, $6.60, $6 something like that, um, depending on what you're getting. Excuse me. Yeah. What is OOP? I was just about to tell you. Oh. Out of the pocket is oh. OOP. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a mistake. I was trying to figure out what that was. <laughs> yes, our annual out of pocket. So I ran out of room and I wanted to show how big the number was. Out of pocket. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, in 2015, our out of pocket is as high as it's ever been, even with the discounts that are being applied. And that's because the cost of drugs go up. I'm afraid there's going to be a day where, you know, I will have, instead of a price tag, I'll have a ticker that just changes digitally because it changes in the hour um, how much the cost of the drug goes up. So right now we're sitting at $7,000 you guys have to pay every year. That's incredible. That's the average. So that's why I'm here because who's got that laying around? You. The Affordable Care Act um, says that in 2020, if it continues the way it's legislated, there will be no more donut hole. You will just get straight coverage all the way through. And it has been closing that gap. You're getting discounts like this because of the Affordable Care Act. So take it with what you will, but that's our current legislation. And by 2020, hopefully we won't have that. Next year, we're still gonna be seeing this 45%, um, and then it'll go down in uh, 2017 a little bit. So we've got, a, we've got a ways, right? We've got five more years of this. What are we gonna do? So think about this too, that so far with this new legislation, people 65 and older have saved $7 billion because there's at least some help with the don't help. Make sure your legislators know that you need that and you want that to continue, you want that thing closed. But here's some tips on how to save money while we're in our current situation. 
Let's seek help from our doctors, our pharmacists, our nurses, our social workers. Seriously, we live making we live for making um, medications affordable, something that will be useful to you. Um, that means going to them and saying, I can't afford this. And when you see a number like $7,000 a year that you're supposed to outlay, it doesn't matter how many cars you have. That's, that's hard to afford for pretty much anyone. So there's no, there's no shame in saying, I can't afford this. This is ridiculous. <laughs> we get it. <laughs> uh, know your formulary. So at least know where to find it. Formularies are these giant, lengthy drug fave picks for your Medicare Part D plan, right? And each thing, like if you have an ailment for cholesterol or an ailment for stomach issues, they'll have their favorites. And those favorites cost way less than their not favorites. Um, so there will be a way for you to call the number on the back of your plan and say, I want to know how to access my formulary. I want to be able to give that website to my doctor because, you know, or my pharmacist, because I want them to look at what else I could be taking that would cost me less money, that kind of thing. Um, also, Make sure that you look into prevention. So that's my favorite, other favorite part of being a pharmacist. I can talk about how to avoid needing the medication in the first place. If it requires you to maybe have 30 minutes of activity five days a week, and then you don't have to take your blood pressure medication anymore, that's 40 to $60 you get to save every month to go spend on something else you enjoy, going to a movie, right? Uh, those things are, <laughs> those are important. Um, prevention also, I put in this list, by the way, I'm giving you like one word answers, but this list is a little bit more exhaustive on my handout that I gave you. And it says that there are many screening services that are free. That's part of this new Affordable Care Act legislation. So if you catch a problem before you need a bunch of medications or salvage therapy by doing a free screening service, that's money back in your pocket, right? And then there are um, behaviors that we can adopt, more exercise, um, eating with more greens in our diet, small things that actually add up at, over time that can make it so that we can eliminate medications or the cost or lower the dose, those kinds of things. And if you have an ailment that you start with, say you have esophageal reflux, and you've been on this medication for over six months, it might be time to try to stop it, those kinds of things. Or you could avoid the problem, the, the causative factors in the first place. So a lot of times smoking can cause issues, limited mobility can cause issues if you're like in the car a lot, long time eating fatty foods. Those things can cause the problem and that's why you need the drug. Well, stop the problem then you can stop the drug. Uh, so that's why I like prevention. It's cheap and it's, it's something that will actually prolong your life instead of having to take a drug that will counteract the issues that it's causing. And then talk to your doctor about samples. If your doctor wants you to try a new drug, then ask for some samples to 10 to 14 days before you put out the money to pay for it. Then you're not obligated to continue with that. And it also makes you go back to your doctor and tell them how you're feeling. Um, that communication alone helps people avoid serious medication problems and complications. So do that and most doctors have samples on hand. There may be a brand that they're giving you, but there's a generic equivalent. Usually they work just about the same. So shop around too. So we have um, another option where you look at what pharmacies are better for you. Is mail order better for you? Maybe. You know, if you don't need to talk to your pharmacist because you don't have a lot of medications, that might be better. I work at a community pharmacy, but it's, it's up to you. What, what can you afford? <laughs> That's what we really care about. Um, sometimes community pharmacies work just as well as long as you take a 90-day supply. So if you do like that interaction with your pharmacist, does your plan allow you to do that? Those are questions you get to ask before you even sign up. Um, and then also remember that if a drug is not covered by Medicare Part D, that's okay. There are usually discount programs, and I've included a link here um, as an example. Like AARP has a healthcare discount card for drugs that are not covered by Medicare Part D, and I know that it works at my pharmacy. And it probably works at other pharmacies. I just can't speak for them, so you don't have to switch to me, but um, there, there are some options, even if it, the drug isn't on your formulary. And there is an 800 number there if you don't like to use the web. Um, make sure that if you're using an online pharmacy where you're ordering all your medications online, that it is a VIPPS certified pharmacy. And I put that acronym in there for your safety. 
V I P P S, you said? Yes, and I don't know what it stands for. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> but um, that is a, it's, it's a certification making sure that the product that they're getting is pure and just as good as the stuff you'd be getting from me. Okay. And then use generics whenever possible or when it's optimal. Sometimes your plan will have a better deal on brand name than they will on generic because they're getting a rebate from the drug company. Fine. But just make sure you, you explore the option of generics and I, I will help you with all of these measures as long as you give me time to do it. I can't do it in an afternoon typically. I've got a lot of other people depending on me to give fast service. They only have 20 minutes to pick up their prescriptions. But if you give me a day or two, maybe a week depending on how long your medication list is, I can come up with ways to help you save money so that you're not, you know, exhausting yourself and spending seven thousand dollars in two months, you know. Um, and I'm happy to do that. So as long as you're patient, then I can help you out. Um, then explore tablet splitting with your pharmacist or your doctor. Some tablets can't be split. Some can, and I would do do that as well. Um, review your Part D plan before choosing one. Here, I'll take this off. So, this is an example of tablet splitting, I should say. There's a 10 milligram tablet you take, but if you took a half of a 20, that would be the same dose. So we would like to help you with that if we can. Um, the Part D plan should be reviewed before you choose one, and all those extra limitations. Um, if you really love to have your community pharmacist, can you, can you still go to them? Maybe not. How much is it going to cost you in your premiums, and how much is it going to estimatedly cost you for your drugs over the course of a year? Well, those things I can tell you with a report. <coughs> I just need 30 minutes, usually, with you to go over the medication list that you currently have. Um, and you got to remember, like, if you go to my pharmacy, I have your medications that you've taken over the last two years. So there's going to be old stuff on there. We don't want to include that. Um, but it will break down where you can get the plan that's in your area. It'll tell you how much you're going to pay in a monthly premium, how much you will estimatedly pay in your out-of-pocket costs for the year. It will tell you if you need to go mail order or if you um, need to be restricted to 90-day supply, those things. But there are things that you won't know unless you call that number like, oh, okay, I have this special headache medication. How many tablets can I get a month? Well, you can only get six for every 30 days or something like that. You want to check for special limitations. And then after you've chosen a plan and you're still finding you're having issues, there are a lot of people that qualify for extra help. There are subsidies in other states that we don't have in Wyoming, but there are some um, government federal assistance programs for those that are below 150% of the federal poverty level. And I've included links on there to tell you if you qualify. So. On the spot where it says Medicare Extra Help, see if you qualify, there is a link that you can you can type in and it will ask you, it'll quiz you and tell you whether or not you're part of the group. And then there's more information on other pharmaceutical assistance programs direct from the manufacturers. There's uh, needymeds.org and a partnership for assistance, pharmaceutical assistance programs, and they keep it pretty current. Those are good ways to, to find extra help. Um, in Casper, you can talk to a live person, um, senior patient advocates. So they're a great group. There, I'm sure there are more. I, it's the only one I know of, and I know the person there. So I know they do a good job. You pay for the service. I think it's like 80, 90 bucks. But you'll make that back in what you say. 120. 120? No. 120 bucks. You will make that back. I guarantee you. And it's nice to have somebody who knows all of the programs. Very helpful. She was very helpful to me getting started. Yeah. I mean, how much, how many afternoons, you know, scouring the internet did you save? Because you didn't well, have to deal with that. She knew how to get there. When I was on, started, it was 65 bucks. It's just moved up to 120 bucks for a visit. Yeah. It's really good. I'm really glad to hear that. If, I think we should use those face-to-face -face contacts. Those people are invested in making sure that we do well. So there's a phone number and a website. And a fax number if you need it. Um, then the, another option here is to not add on drugs. Say your first blood pressure medication didn't work, and then they added a second one, and maybe by the time they added a third, it worked. Now is the time to explore taking away a medication that might not have worked. And I don't know if we talk about that a lot, but as a consultant pharmacist, that's one of my major interventions is 
taking away medications that no longer work, but they just seem to layer them on. Uh, there, there was a time when I alluded to also, you know, taking a medication that you started off for an acute problem, but it's stuck on there forever. <laughs> well, that those medications, uh, say they're for your stomach or whatever, may be good to try discontinuing them and see how you do without it. Um, long term, sometimes these medications aren't so good for us. And as we get older, sometimes the risks out start to outweigh the benefits because we're progressing so far in our lives that it's not going to really do us any good. It's just going to cost us money. Well, then ditch it. And so um, think about that. And every time we meet with our doctors, have a pointed conversation like, what can I get rid of? I see that you know I have three medications my pharmacist told me for blood pressure. I'd like to get rid of one and see if I do OK. What do you recommend to get rid of? Yeah. They, they will help you with that. They just are apprehensive. So if you start the conversation, it'll, they'll do it. Um, and then also, let's remember to store medications properly. So the hot, steamy medicine cabinet in the bathroom may increase the, the degradation of your drug. And then what you've paid for you know, is only 20% as effective as it was when you picked it up from the pharmacy. Or leaving your um, nitro tabs you know, in your, in your glove box of your car. Might not work as well when you need them. So those medications you just paid for and you basically dump down the toilet. Because so. basically they lose their effect just like anything else, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The sun, the, the air, all that stuff de degrades the substance. So we try to keep it in the original bottle, stored properly. And if you have any questions, there's a link on your... Um, Stamp out prescription drug abuse, I believe. I believe there is a link that tells you how to store and dispose of medications in the same loop. And then also, the final measure that we can take for saving money when we're in the donut hole is to consider over-the-counter alternatives. So, what um, two areas that I see this happening a lot in is allergies and reflux. Those are some great over-the-counter drugs that are available that are no longer covered by insurance, but they work just as well as the prescription ones that are covered, and they cost less. Mm -hmm. so. Prilosec? Prilosec, exactly. Flonase. Yes. Yeah, those, those medications are, and those are just a couple, there are plenty of other ones, but those may help us when, you know, we used to have a prescription that cost 50 bucks a month. Um, those over-the-counter alternatives will often not count toward your out-of-pocket expenses, so you get to weigh the pros and cons of that. And those are all of my suggestions for you. Some will work, some won't. And talking to your pharmacist or talking to your doctor, whoever's more accessible, they will help you do this as long as you give us time to do it. I know I have a nephew that's a doctor, and he says the one thing that you want to ask your doctor, do you have samples? Because he said most every doctor does because they have them come in and give them samples. You're right. And then eventually they have to come in and pick them up because they have expired. Yes, asking for samples, those medications that are sitting in the closet of the doctor's office just gathering dust if you don't ask for them. It's a great way to save money. But we don't get federal assistance to buy over-the-counter drugs, do we? No. no. That's the that's the trade-off. Yeah. Okay. Because mm -hmm. indeed, the the Prilosec, I can get omeprazole, and they pay a participation in that, and my omeprazole was cheaper than doing the Prilosec. Yeah. So for me, I was paying less out-of-pocket money by using a prescription because I got government participation. Yeah, you're right. Sometimes the prescription is way cheaper just yeah. because. I don't of know about way, but it was a, enough difference to pay attention to. Do you have any questions for me? Anything? Talking about, I uh, just mentioned um, after the drug expired made me think. Now, obviously, when you know when you've got an expiration date on a medication that says July seventh, it doesn't automatically just become ineffective or dangerous at midnight that day. I mean, is there like is there a grace period or anything like that? That uh, I mean, I know that's not necessarily. You don't want to take something four years after it's expired, but I mean, how does that work? 
<laughs> so they, they've done tests on most drugs and they're, they're required to have them last for at least a year in an amber bottle that's been given to you by a pharmacy. Unless it's a drug, a drug that they know lasts less and then I have to tell you that. Um, there's some um, like anti-clotting drugs that do that where they're only good for four months. Um, but the point is that no, it's not going to be bad by midnight, but my question would be then if I had somebody coming in who said, well, I've had this drug for a year and now I'm starting to take it. Well, that was a 30-day supply. Why is it lasting a year? Mm -hmm. um, maybe you, sh you don't even need it. What about for things like Tylenol or ibuprofen or things like that? Tylenol and ibuprofen, um, I would still. And I asked because I was just looking at my medicine cabinet and I have some stuff that expired in March, you know. <laughs> I mean, Tylenol and ibuprofen is pretty cheap. And I was, personally, I wouldn't give it to my kid. Well, so am I. I'm pretty cheap, too. You're pretty so. cheap. So I, I, would, I have to stick with nobody's going to help you out if you take an expired med. And is that worth it to you? Yeah. If it is, then take it. And if, you're, if you have a problem, just know you're on your own. It's like driving without insurance. Nobody's checking your insurance card when you get in the car, but if you get in an accident, you're toast. Okay, so. I'll get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, do you have anything to do with cancer medication? Our pharmacy doesn't deal with that medication just because of the storage requirements. There are a couple of chemotherapy drugs that we allow just because they're in types tablet storage but I'm thinking you're talking more like IV cancer medication or you well about... I'm reading more and more in magazines and newspaper that uh, people with cancer needing cancer drugs like you know um, it's getting to be like ten thousand dollars a month and I'm just I think that's unheard of and it's getting worse and worse so is there any help for those kind of people? I don't need it or have it or want it. Or but, want uh, it. <laughs> um, I, I, in case I was diagnosed with that, I, the idea of $10,000 a month, you know, I just, well, dig a hole for them. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so medications that cost extreme amounts of money, $10,000 a month, are, and it's not just cancer anymore. We have rheumatoid arthritis, we have multiple sclerosis, all those medications. My, my, my fridge at work has probably over $100,000 worth of medication in it today, just sitting there. And I'm, I'm lowballing that figure. So yeah, we, we do have a lot of people that need extra help. And usually they're bumped into that catastrophic coverage yes. right away. And there are special special programs for people who have that okay. issue. And usually our specialists know about those programs and they plug them in. So nice. that first item on the list on saving money, talking to your doctor, pharmacist, nurse, social worker, those are the those are the people that would which get you through in that kind of a bind. Well, just reading about it scares me. You know, <laughs> I'm aware of all of this and deal with that too daily, but I mean, um, catastrophic is. Mm. I think your Parkinson's disease fits in there too. Absolutely, Parkinson's disease does fit in there. Heart transplant. Mm -hmm. Heart transplant, absolutely. I mean, we're not even talking about the cost of the procedure. I know one guy that's got 32, 32 pills a day cocktail. Where's the room for food if you're taking 32 pills a day? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> we need seriously. to make them burger flavored or something. If, um, if a physician uh, prescribes something and, um, and you see it and realize that there is a generic available, do you offer that to the patient? Is that their responsibility to ask if it's a, a generic or? Uh... Our pharmacy automatically substitutes a yes. generic if as long as the doctor has written that generic is permissible. Yes. So they have to go out of their way to say brand is medically necessary, in which case we leave it alone. Um, and then I may ha still have a conversation at the counter with a patient who says, 90 bucks? I'm not paying 90 bucks for this one, then I would offer the generic. So, but yeah, we automatically substitute that if we can save you money. Or if we so you're, get you're to know and say, hey, well, you're able and allowed to do that then. 
But if the doctor has put down the branded, the name for the branded drug, to do that, don't you have to call the doctor and say, hey, you mind if we shift over to a generic? The only time I have to do that is if the generic is not totally bioequivalent or if they put brand as medically necessary. So I have prescribers who give me names of drugs that are only available as brand and they give me the generic name. I still dispense the brand because that's all there is. And if they don't specify that brand is medically necessary, I can automatically substitute that Oops. equivalent generic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That happened with Lumigan. There wasn't a generic for Lumigan eye drops for glaucoma. Uh, I guess for a long, long, long time. And I'm not so sure there is yet. No, I think you're thinking of um, Latanoprost, which is now the yes. generic. Um, and I can't remember off the top of my head the brand name, but Lumigan we still dispense. That's something we store um, at room temperature. And then Latanoprost we, we ask you to put in the fridge until you're able to use it. And oh, drugs like that that start off in the fridge can sometimes be left out for the entire time you're using it over the counter. Like at room temperature. So if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer those as well. Hmm. Very good. Yeah, if you ever have any need, you can come by and see me. But you can also talk to your local pharmacist. They they love this stuff just as much as I do. All right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much.